Let's take a moment and begin with a prayer. Father, we thank you. We praise you for the work that was done by the scientists and the doctors in the development of the flu vaccine. And we thank you that it's being administered now and hopefully will change the system under which we're living right now. We thank you in the name of Jesus, our Lord. So what we were talking about last week was China in the 1900s, and we talked about the Boxer Rebellion against the uh, foreigners in China, and that it was put down uh, rather uh, strictly by Western powers that moved in. As a result of that, in 1912, the intervention by the European powers convinced the Chinese to do away with the Manchu government. The emperor resigned, and under a, under a man by the name of Sun Yat-sen, a national people, people's party was formed. But civil unrest did not end. I think any one of us who's ever seen a map, you know the size of China, and it, it's just a massive place, but it's very difficult as far as getting it, getting it organized. So anyway, the, uh, the difficulties continued, but Sun Yat-sen was the government. In 1853, Japan, after many years of isolation, several centuries in fact, opened up and it began with a show of force on the part of the United States, sending several warships to the islands. And actually the Americans were not in any way declaring war on the Japanese. It was, as the United States used to do a lot at that time, a show of the power of the United States and our desire really to be in diplomatic relations with Japan. So that's what took place. Um, Japan at that time was not a single united country, but still very strong. And the people were united in their dislike of Western interference. One of the things, if you ever visit Japan, you'll discover that people have an immense pride in being Japanese. And there are a lot of things. There are two major religions. There's Buddhism, there's Shintoism and stuff. And that is not their primary loyalty in either case. Their primary loyalty is being Japanese. There are people who are liberal, there are people who are conservative. Their primary thing is they're Japanese. I have never seen anywhere the uh, attachment to racial uh, things like you would see in Japan. Uh, I think we know in the Second World War they tried to play that in Germany, but it didn't play like it does in Japan. It just, they could not pull it off. So one of the most successful reforms in all of history began with the restoration of the emperor. When the, uh, the Westerners arrived, Japan realized they needed to get together as a country, not these, all these little units. So they reestablished the emperor, and the emperor began a huge reform. They first of all reformed their educational system, and then they modernized the country. But they did it in such a way that preserved Japanese traditions. Uh, it's really interesting if you go to the country today, you go into a building, I describe a hotel I went to, uh, and this was not in downtown Tokyo. This was a regular hotel out somewhere. And you go into the hotel, and we were met at the door by a robot. And the robot asked our names, spoke to us, carried on a conversation, and the robot led us over to the desk. And uh, then, you know, we talked to a person about setting up the room and everything, and the robot led us to our room. The curious thing is, that the robot greeted us at the door with the typical Japanese bow. And then, so, so you find these little things preserved through the whole deal, while the country is immensely modern. And that began at this time. In 1906, Japan defeated Russia in a war. And um, Russia was rather weak at that time, but Russia was viewed as a large, strong country. And Japan was viewed basically as a small island. But it became very, very clear to the entire world at that point that Japan, Japan was a very strong and a very modern 
country. Despite many persecutions, the church remained alive since the time of Francis Xavier. Now remember we're talking about them going in in the 1800s and uh, Francis Xavier uh, died in 1530 and by the 1600s they had begun the terrible persecution of the church. And so the, the, ch the church was preserved in Japan without clergy, without any religious orders, without Westerners, that the church was preserved by the Japanese. When Father Petagine, who was uh, with the, uh, one of the chaplains on the American warships, when he arrived in Nagasaki, he discovered vivid proof of the presence of the church. He was approached by a group of Catholic Japanese who still followed the prayers and the catechisms of the Catholic Church. Incidentally, they asked him two questions. They asked him if he had a father in Rome, and they asked him if he had a mother in heaven. And they were referring to the Pope and Mary, although they didn't know their names. And so they took him out, and one of the things the Japanese people had no sacraments or anything, they were worshiping a small box that historically we've concluded was probably a box that was used to take communion to the sick at one time. So it was like a pyx and had held the Eucharist. So they, they basically worshiped it. And it turned out at the time there were 25,000 Catholics in Japan. Now remember Nagasaki was the city to which the, um, uh, the authorities exiled all Christians at one point, moved them all there. So it would be natural if they were alive somewhere, that would be it. In 1889, religious freedom was given to Christianity and Leo XIII appointed an archbishop for the city of Tokyo. Both Leo XIII and Pius X were on extremely good terms with the Japanese court. I think you know that in, in the Orient, whether it's China or Japan or things like this, the formal things that go on are very, very different than the way formal things go on here. And oftentimes, because of the, uh, what do I want to say, the, uh, the complexity of their formal traditions and the fact of their not being that really important. You know, you know, the interesting thing is if you study, I'll describe it as politeness. If you study politeness, you discover you can't argue for any of the things being right. Like, why is it right to use a fork rather than a spoon? Well, there isn't a big deal to that. You'd think you'd use a fork for solids, and that's true. You'd think you'd use a spoon for liquids. That's not always true. And so, we, we have all these different rules, but because we have these rules, you can sit down at a table and we eat a meal together in comfort. Um, when I was in uh, the Philippines, uh, I was at a dinner one time for uh, a couple uh, people, there are about 20 people there, but one couple was a couple that was really advocating the older traditions of the Philippines and uh, one of the things they refused to use was utensils at the table. They ate with their hands, everything, you know. It actually makes you very uncomfortable at the table. Is there anything wrong with it? No, all of us have had a two-year-old who did it. It's not that big a deal, but it just is not the way you conduct. So these things went on, and uh, the Japanese, uh, uh, what do you call it, were very well served by both Leo XIII and Pius X, who maintained, it's still present in the Vatican, maintain a, um, what do you want to call it, a, a school, let's say, of culture, so that if you're going to be sent by the Roman Catholic Church to Japan, you go through an entire year of where to bow, how to bow, how deep you bow, why you bow, this sort of thing. And they go through all these things so you understand the customs and do not unnecessarily and accidentally offend another culture. Um, I, I had an, ex an example of that when I was in um, India. There was a sort of an abandoned temple 
ruins on the, uh, the grounds of the hotel where I was staying. And there was a, um, uh, I guess I would call him a Hindu holy man who used to go there and just sit there all day, and sit and meditate. And that's not unusual to find that in India. And uh, I was over looking at the place at one time and he was, he was very offended because I was wearing shoes. But I wasn't inside the ruins at all. It's just that what I didn't know was the ruins had extended further out and he considered it sacred from where the temple had been. And so, but there, there are things that, like that, that it's, it's difficult if you aren't part of a culture, but there's a school, and again in the Vatican, to specifically train uh, Catholics who are involved in, in this sort of thing. Um, more Catholic missionaries came to Japan, but at this time there was actually an avalanche of Protestant missionaries from many different denominations. And by 1914, there were 70,000 Catholics. You realize that's about twice what there was when we arrived. But at that time, there was 100,000 Protestants, and they hadn't been there at all before. So they were, they were very successful with the, the number of missionaries and everything they sent. The numbers of converts were very disappointing to the Catholic Church. I think that's historically true. In Japan, um, the church has never really caught on the people who are Japanese who are Catholics were very strong Catholics and stood through persecutions and everything. But there hasn't been that many that come. And I think there's still kind of a residual thing that the church is not Japanese, okay? That, that, that's a residual thing there that kind of prevents that. The um, influence of the church was extremely dramatic, however, in schools, social work, publishing programs, and many Japanese actually knew much more about the Catholic Church than they ever did about Buddhism. The Catholic Church was very present in their society and everything. Now remember, they're attached to being Japanese, not to Buddhism, okay? So they found out Catholic moral teachings tremendously influenced the Japanese. And many Catholics rose to very important positions in the country largely because of their morality. It's um, an interesting thing when you go to Japan to watch the whole, I'll describe it as, as the morals and the way, the way people deal with one another. Like stealing, you would not steal. Nobody steals in Japan, you just don't do it. The things, and, and yet there's, there's very little respect for women, okay? But what this Japanese hold as moral standards, they're, they're very, very strong. Uh, when I was, my friend and I, when we were traveling on trains in Japan, um, if, if there were no seats and there were, you know, particularly elderly women standing, uh, we would stand up for them. But no, uh, no woman would let a man of my age give her my seat. They, they simply wouldn't do that. My younger friend, occasionally they did, but there was always an argument about it before they would take his seat. It's, a, it's just a, a, a very, very strange thing. But anyway, the Catholic Church had a huge influence in Japan, largely in the morals, in the teaching, and that sort of thing. Um, Shintoism, which is the traditional religion of Japan, actually grew a lot stronger under the influence of the church and there was a growing interest in understanding the Japanese religions on the part of the Catholic missionaries. Now that's one of the things we've started, um, again, the 1800s, we've started in uh, the Catholic Church, uh, probably with Pius X before that, is that we want to understand the, the area where people are going. One of the, um, one of the things you study in philosophy is that Thomas Aquinas says this. He says, everything that is said is heard in the manner of the listener. So uh, I'll give you an example. 
uh, when I go to Nativity Parish, which is an adjoining parish here, and, and teach uh, scripture, uh, and uh, do liturgies, rather, I do mass there almost every day because they, they still have mass every day there. But uh, when I go over there on Sundays, I will usually preach two different sermons. It's because I say two different masses, and I find it easier to have a different sermon at each service because I feel more enthusiastically involved in it than if I'm repeating a sermon from another service. But they will ask me, because they put one of the masses online, they inevitably will ask me, well, which one do you want online? And I would always tell them, I said, the one you think is best, because it doesn't matter what I think is best. What you want to know is what did the listener think is best? And as a result of that, if we want to really present the Catholic faith, we have to know the basic understandings in the people. You can use words. I'll give you an example in the United States. You, you can use a word that is a death knell and not even think about it at all. When we in the United States think of crusades, we think of a lot of things. I think of the crusade against cancer. I think of the uh, crusades for different kinds of diseases and different kinds of collections and stuff like that. I think of all kinds of things. When you go to the Mideast, the only thing they think of is the uh, troops from Europe who went through looting and murdering people in uh, the Mideast. And if you remember one time uh, when the troops were going to, uh, I think, Iraq, George Bush said that it was a crusade against uh, the Al-Qaeda or evil or something like that. But as soon as he said the word crusade, no one in the Mideast heard anything else he said. All they heard was crusade. Now, if you're going to be teaching religion or you're going to teach anything, you have to know trigger words and how something is understood in the society in which you are, are living. So um, people had very little knowledge of the culture, customs, and religion of Japan. And the Japanese interest in the church served to be a beginning of interest in anything Western as the church moving into Japan caused the Western countries to be interested in Japan itself as far as culture. In 1903, Pius X became Pope. He was personally a very holy man with a great concern for priests and a love of the poor, as well as being intelligent, hardworking, and an effective pastor. Pius XII was one of the best popes we've had in our history, and he came at exactly the right time. When, remember, the church had lost the uh, papal states, and the church was kind of adrift politically. Uh, we didn't have a country from which we spoke or anything like that. Well, Pius X was able culturally, culturally and stuff to identify with all these people because of his great pastoral approach. He was, I'll give you an example today would be the Dalai Lama. The Dalai Lama no longer has a country. The Dalai Lama is living in exile in Italy. And there are very few political leaders in the entire world that have more universal acceptance than the Dalai Lama. Pius X was like that in his day. Um, as a reformer, he did a great amount of work, actually in a relatively short time. He reformed the Curia. The Curia is that body that basically uh, runs the church. And uh, it's, you could compare it, I guess, to the, um, uh, I can't think of the name of that group of people that work for the president, but the, um, he appoints these people to this, this group that works with him. And under most presidents, that group works kind of independently of the president because they're involved in all the details. And uh, the, it's like that in the, in the church. The curia is involved in all the details of the things. And the pope basically is in charge of it, but he leaves most of it to the curia. And they are constantly in need of reform. In the United States, I mean the cabinet, okay? But they're entirely... They're always in need of reform in the church, largely, because once you're on the curia, you're probably there for life. In the United States, I think you know the cabinet changes with each president. 
but uh, you're, you're there for life in Curia. So another thing he dealt with was seminary education and uh, included, he expanded the studies. He expanded the, to a study of spirituality. Very interesting, you'd think a seminary, that would be the basic thing. But in the seminary, there are three basic things. Number one is sacred scripture. Number two is moral theology, that's what we do. And the third is dogmatic theology, that's what we believe. So in dogmatic theology, you discover there's one God, three persons, how we know that from scripture, how the three persons are interrelated, operate, that sort of thing. And then when you go into moral theology, you discover um, why stealing is wrong, how you deal with stealing, how you get over it, what's the punishment for stealing, all that sort of stuff. So those things. But he added, first of all, the spirituality study, which became very, very important. I would say in the seminary I was in, that was one of the most important studies. We had a, a spiritual director in the seminary who came from Hungary. He'd been the rector of the seminary in Budapest. And when the uh, Nazis came in, he went to a concentration camp. He was released when Hungary was liberated and then put back in a camp by the communists. And uh, eventually during the revolution, which Cardinal Mincenti was part of in Hungary, he came to the United States. But what he did was take a year, let's say one year in the seminary, we studied Ignatius, uh, spirituality, which is the Jesuit. And each evening he would give us a talk on Ignatian spirituality. And we were asked to follow Ignatian spirituality for the year. Ignatian spirituality is founded on obedience, absolute obedience, okay? So we would do that. The next year we'd take Franciscan and he'd talk about the different things of the Franciscan spirituality through the year. And Franciscan spirituality is basically founded on poverty. That's figuring how much you can do without, okay? It's, it's a whole thing of poverty. But he did this with these different kinds of spiritualities. And uh, the Carmelite spirituality is built on how you deal with suffering and difficulty. And so each of these, and we'd do it for a year, and then he said at the end of the seminary, we would have done eight years of that. Uh, so we'd encounter eight different spiritualities. And at the end of that, he hoped we worked out his spirituality, probably taking piecemeal from these for one that worked for us. So maybe his spirituality was included. Another thing he added, a year of philosophy. Uh, by the time I entered the seminary, there were two years of philosophy before they allowed you to start studying theology. When I went to the seminary, there were two years of the basic requirements for uh, a university degree. We call them the required subjects. That was followed by two years of the studies that you would complete for your degree if you were going into any particular area. Um, in the seminary, where we were going was into philosophy. So the second year, two years were philosophy. First were our requirements, second were philosophy. Those four years, we ended up with a baccalaureate in philosophy. Then you started four years of theology. And the basic thing of philosophy, philosophy taught you two things. It taught you how to reason very carefully, and it simultaneously uh, taught you the meaning of words. So that like everyone, when someone said a word, everyone meant the same thing. I, I, just to give you an example, uh, I was listening to a discussion the other day where the people who were talking were confusing two words. One is concentration camp and the other is ghetto. And a concentration camp and a ghetto are both places that isolate a group from society itself. Okay? So the, the Nazis tried to isolate the Jews. Okay? But, you know, the Jews isolate themselves sometimes in a ghetto. The difference between a ghetto and a concentration camp is whether the people choose to be there. So if I were to decide I want to live in a community of nothing but Roman Catholics and go into a little town where the, that would be a ghetto, okay? 
And we find in the United States, we have Italian ghettos, Mexican ghettos and stuff. A lot of our cities have ghettos. But a ghetto is where people choose to live. A concentration camp is where the government forces them to live. Okay, so they're a lot alike, but there's a slight difference. In philosophy, you learn to use words correctly so that when we're discussing theology particularly, we're all talking about the same thing. So we had the philosophy there. Finally, he demanded that seminaries use the standards of public education, which is why I had to do two years of requirements as the beginning of the whole thing. So our standards have to be the same as the uh, uh, colleges. And that's why many seminaries are connected. The seminary I went to, first seminary I went to was on the campus of the University of San Diego. The second university I went to was in the University of Ottawa, Canada, and the studies were at the university, although we lived separately from it. I also went for uh, a couple of summers to Catholic University in Washington, D.C. But by having them actually universities, that guarantees that you're going through the requirements of uh, public education. He also started the requirement called the Ad Lima requirement that every bishop, once every five years, goes to Rome. And you can almost see the tenor of the, uh, of the church at a time. Like, for instance, when John Paul was elderly and the Curia was more in charge than John Paul was, when a bishop went to Rome for the Ad Lima visit, the five-year visit, he usually was lectured by different people out of the Curia about what they wanted done in his diocese. Whereas if you would look at the beginning of John Paul and then the later bishops as well, the Ad Lima visit was for them to tell the Pope what was going on in their diocese and what they thought they needed. It was a very, very different thing. But it's once every five years every bishop is supposed to do this. Unlike Leo XIII, Pius X was not interested in the study of new ideas and trends in philosophy. A philosophy was going through a big change. Now, the whole world was going through a big change at this point. But uh, he was very um, uninterested in new ideas. And uh, so in, in one sense, he was very liberal about upgrading the church and that sort of thing. But he was very conservative with, with new ideas. Um, he renewed the confraternity of Christian doctrine and had a new catechism prepared for the church. You can always tell when there's a conservative movement, there'll always be a catechism, which is a list of things you can, can do and can't. Christians of many denominations at this time were rethinking their theology in the light of the modern world. I'll give you an example in, in the, uh, just in, in scripture studies. Um, we, at this time in scripture study, we had a specific date at when the world began, and by specific, specific date, I mean like 10 centuries ago or 20 centuries ago, we had a specific thing. It was based on the ages of the people as the descendants from Adam. The, the, a seven-day creation, Adam was created, everything started, so we could figure out from how long those people lived, uh, how long the world was gone. But the discovery of fossils and things like that were saying that that was wrong, okay? And so, so we had to kind of look at things like that. But there was a lot in science that was going on that was very questioning of, of theology. Um, Pius X came out very harshly against all of this, and it's generally agreed today that theological scholarship in the Roman Catholic Church suffered greatly under Pius X. Now, he increased the education. There's a lot of things that he did were very, very good, but scholarship in the church suffered. Um, some of the modern thinkers at the time left the church, but most sort of um, submitted. One of the interesting things in the church, if I were to study something that was very, um, the church considered it, it was outlandish, the church would not tell me not to believe it, and the church would not tell me not to study it. 
but the church would say, I can't teach it, okay? Because you can't tell someone to believe something, they believe what they believe. And you can't tell someone to contradict their understanding, but you can tell them to be quiet. And so that's normally the way the church kind of, kind of deals with this thing. And a lot of scholars could not take being shut up. An example I would take in the Roman Catholic Church is Teilhard de Chardin, who was doing huge studies in paleontology. And everything he was coming up with was, of course, contradicting the fact that the church was found, uh, the world was created, let's say, 5,000 years ago or something. Everything he was studying uh, was throwing that out. So the church told him to be quiet. We have today over 30 books that were written by Teilhard de Chardin. And during his lifetime, he never published one, okay? He kept his notes, everything, did exactly what he was told, kept up his studies, and we have all of his theology. I oftentimes think today, that if Martin Luther had had that attitude with the things he wanted to see done in the church, what we had happen at Vatican II would have happened 200 years earlier. But he would have to keep writing and keep quiet. You know, that's very difficult for a scholar, extremely difficult. And uh, in the light of these new trends, Pius X condemned modernism with a decree and required every priest to take the oath against modernism. Now, you had to take it at the time of ordination, and I took the oath of modernism three times. I took it when I was ordained a deacon, I took it when I was ordained a, a subdeacon, which we don't have anymore, and I took it when I was ordained a priest. And I want you to know I have no idea what it is. And it, there was no clear definition of modernism. It was almost as though you have to be very careful of anything that's new. Well, careful is one thing, okay? But you figure out whether it's good or bad or anything, but you're careful about anything you haven't seen before. That's just sanity. But the way this was written, you had to really stay away from these things. And uh, it was written in such a way that it would not violate your conscience to take it because you didn't really know what it was and the decree itself didn't know what it was. So um, I, did, I would say generally we all took it and I don't think it's required anymore. In 1860, near the end of the 1800s, Catholic intellectual life suddenly revived in England and many particular authors defended the church in their writings. Um, this, is, this is a powerful time for the, uh, the Catholic Church, most particularly in England. And to some of these names, Gerald, Gerald Manley Hopkins uh, was one of the most important writers of the entire period. He's a, a Jesuit and he was a major poet of uh, Victorian England. And I think probably he wrote, if I remember correctly, he wrote The Hound of Heaven, which is probably the best known of his works. He revolutionized English poetry by his use of what's called sprung rhythm, which emphasizes the rhythms and the sounds of words so that they, they, they rhyme. G.K. Chesterton was a poet, and he wrote essays and novels. And he had a very unique style. His books today are still very good. But um, G.K. Chesterton, his works were full of paradoxes, and he had a great ability to write with huge humor about very serious manners in a lot, in a lot of his, uh, uh, here's serious matters. In a lot of his works, he will describe the working conditions in England and the, the terrible uh, problems that people were going through in the beginning of industrialization and everything. But he had a way of making it humorous. And I think you know that if you can make something humorous, people can understand almost anything. They can, they can read it relaxed if it's, uh, it's made humorous. There were also a number of authors in France at this time and they turned their study to the church. And in the French system, 
They study much more spirituality. You know, one of the things that I've found fascinating, because I studied for several years in French Canada, I lived in French Canada when I was going to the University of Ottawa, and um, they, they have a very different way of viewing the world, and the French view things in a very spiritual sense, where we tend to view things in a very mathematical sense in the United States. But you had to know that when you were studying theology, because if, if a, an American, for instance, is, is writing that Jesus Christ is God, that's a very clear mathematical statement. Jesus Christ is God. A Frenchman would write, Jesus Christ exercises the powers of Lord over the universe. Now, does that mean he's God? It could. It doesn't necessarily. But why would the Frenchman say that? It sounds nicer. When you read French uh, theology, you need to know that at times they will use an ambiguous word because it sounds better. You should know what they're talking about anyway if you're reading the work itself. But they, if you lift out a quote, it's very difficult to deal with it. Uh, I found that when I was studying Chardin, that when you study Teilhard de Chardin, you need to know that he's looking for the beautiful. His texts are gorgeous, but he's looking for the beautiful. And the French, because the beauty is in their use of ideas, not just the words. For that reason, the French writings have that same sort of mystical thing when they're translated into English. So, Paul Claudel wrote plays, and he too was examining the uh, mystical side of Roman Catholicism, and he very frequently wrote books on the Bible. Charles Paget had strong ideals and was passionately interested in justice. And the funny thing is he's most famous for his poems on uh, Joan of Arc. But they, they, these were writers in France. Although many in Europe thought that the church was out of touch with life, the Roman Catholic writers, many of these writers now we're talking about were actually converts to Roman Catholicism. And when they were converts, what they carried was a huge enthusiasm you always find in converts. So in their writings, there was more enthusiasm for the church than you actually saw in the church proper. But they brought that because most all of them were converts. Um, however, at this time, common workers in Europe no longer supported the church. And many uh, scholars and really educated people viewed the Catholic church as a relic of, medieval, of the medieval world. However, as there was a growing emphasis on the study of history and tradition, um, they would turn to the church. Uh, Ludwig Pasteur wrote a vivid and very balanced 16-volume uh, history of the popes. Um, the, the problem is that oftentimes Catholic authors will gloss over many of the problems and weaknesses of the uh, popes. And non-Catholic authors will overemphasize the problems and weaknesses of the popes. And so it's very difficult to get a balanced view. Uh, it's, uh, and I, th I think we, ha we have a tendency to, uh, to consider people good or bad, and, uh, and I'm talking about famous people. And when we consider someone bad, uh, we tend to see everything bad about them and not notice any of the good. Uh, an interesting one I may have mentioned to you before, uh, there was a TV show for a while called The Meeting of the Minds. Uh, Steve Allen, I think, is the one who put it on. And uh, he would take a group of uh, actors and Individually, they would try and take on the persona of some famous person in history, reading all about them and everything. 
and then they'd come together and have a discussion about something. But anyway, one of the people there was Attila the Hun once, and I, uh, my view of Attila the Hun is a raving, bloodthirsty maniac. But very interesting, do you know that Attila the Hun was the first person to give equal rights to women with regards to education? Attila the Hun was the first one to insist that all his people get an education. Education was very, very important to Attila the Hun. And you know, you just, you just don't think of this. But we tend to lionize people. And it's important to remember, there is no person so good that there's no evil in them. And no person so evil that there's no good. That, that just doesn't exist in reality. Uh, another man at this time was uh, a man by the name of Leopold Van Ronke. Uh, he was a German Lutheran, and he emphasized very strongly the, uh, the role of the church in history and its influence and importance for Germany, although he himself was Lutheran. Um, there's a, uh, a man named Thomas Macaulay, uh, who's an English Lutheran, and I think he's very well worth quoting on this subject. It, it's a wonderful quote. I, I love the quote myself. I think any Catholic would. He, now remember he's Lutheran, and remember he lives in England. There is not, and never was on the face of the earth, a work of human policy so well deserving of examination as the Roman Catholic Church. She saw the commencement of all the governments and all the ecclesiastical establishments that exist in the world today. And we feel no assurance that she's not destined to see the end of them all. So he recognized, with their, at Cal Poly one time, there was a professor teaching business who emphasized that you cannot study about doing something with regards to business without simultaneously studying the longevity of the Catholic Church. What is it about the Catholic Church that gives it such longevity that we've survived governments against us, we've survived totally corrupt leadership in the church, we've survived just all kinds of things, and there's something about it. Now, as a Roman Catholic, I would trace it all back to the thing of Jesus, the gates of hell will not prevail against you. But if you don't take that, you have to find what is it about the church that somehow keeps it. The 1900s, with the dawn of the 20th century, new ways were developing for looking at people and reality. This was a period of revolution in the minds and the hearts of all the creative people in the West. And just to give you some example, Sigmund Freud now published a book on the interpretation of dreams as part of his development of psychoanalysis. Um, a psychoanalysis began at this time. Sigmund Freud developed it. And people came to see there was a great connection between words, symbols, and personal problems. And remember I told you that the, the idea of uh, crusade is a trigger word in the Mideast? that we all have trigger words. Like, like the word, if you were taking American, the word father is very triggered by your father, okay? And we learn that in teaching catechism in the Catholic Church. Some children, it's better never to use the word father with them with regards to God because of their image of father. Some people, it's the best word to use. And it's very interesting, God in the scriptures will describe himself as father, mother, lover, friend, and he, he chooses all these different things so that you and I can find where, you know, we understand it. So Sigmund Freud did that. Nietzsche, Frederick, called people to develop their human powers beyond the demands of social and national life, okay? Be more than is demanded of you, okay? He spoke of the Superman moving beyond the demands of everyday life. Incidentally, this is a theme that will be picked up very strongly by the Nazis, the idea of becoming Superman. A new freedom of vision was spreading through painting, sculpture, 
musician, and writer. Art was changing completely with regards to these things. Some artists move away from a scene, moved away from how a scene might appear to a viewer and attempted to portray their personal feelings in art. Uh, one of the things to know about art is at this time in history, we see the beginnings of the development of photography. So if you want a perfect portrait of a person, these artists would say, take a picture. The painting was to do more, okay? Cubism. Cubism began in Paris, and it was brought there and developed by a Pablo Picasso, who himself is from Spain. He, greatly influ he was greatly influenced by African sculpture for some reason, and uh, he used geometrical shapes. He worked with George Brock to create Cubism, and it became an artistic style. Uh, uh, Picasso went through many different styles, but anyway, Cubism was one of them. In Munich, they had the Blue Rider movement, began with Franz Marc, Paul Klee, and Wasley Kadinsky. Incidentally, Klee and Kadinsky will be part of an architectural movement we'll discuss later that came up in, uh, in Germany. And um, the spokesman for the group was Kadinsky. He stressed the emotional qualities of colors, lines, and shapes while feeling no need to paint things as they might appear. So he didn't paint things the way they looked to you, but when he was painting, he painted his emotions, his colors, and all that in it. This new approach to reality also took place in music and sculpture. Jacob Leibniz experimented with geometrical shapes, creating shapes that looked remarkably like skeletons, but were very obviously human beings, like you could tell they were human beings. Um, both Igor Stravinsky and Arnold Schoenberger began to structure their compositions musically in very non-traditional ways. See, right now, we have a musical scale we use in the West. They have a different one they use in the East. But when we began to encounter in Japanese and Chinese music this whole different scale, then these artists began to pull that in and mix it. In literature, James Joyce developed stream of consciousness, playing with words to explore the whole of human life. Stream of consciousness is a way of writing the way your mind works, so that um, you will be describing, let's say I'm listening to a recipe on uh, uh, the TV, and I'm making, uh, let's, say, uh, let's say I'm making cinnamon toast, okay? So he will describe about the use of bread. And when he does, I consciously smell home-baked bread my grandmother used to make. They used to, one day a week, they would bake all the bread they would need at the house. And that was a wonderful day. The smell was in the house. And you go in and you take the end of the loaf off and put butter on the hot crust. Everyone did that that day. And it, absolutely, so you, you mentioned bread, that comes to my senses. We go to cinnamon, and I remember the rolls my mother used to make for Sunday morning. And I mean, that every word carries feeling, emotional response, and sensual things to it. And usually that goes through our minds so fast we hardly notice it, but James Joyce triggered on it. And an example of that, again, is the use of the word crusade, which triggers this, this picture of armies um, the Frenchman, Marcel Proust, explored the links between time and eternity, memory and experiences. See, that's much the same thing. What is the linkage there? He thought that all of life's experiences were to be found in the white writer's memory of things past. So that one of the, we all have common experiences. We all have experiences of being in love. It's different, but we know what it is. We all have experiences of oppressive authority. We all have experiences of authority that's encouraging. We have all these experiences. And Proust would call us to somehow uh, catch these and bring them to the fore. Okay, why don't we call it there and pick it up here uh, next week.
Thank you very much.